Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Vile Files Ask Nick Edition. I'm your host, Nick, joined by the household of Ali. Um, no, Amanda's still gone. She's uh, where the fuck is Amanda these days? Uh, do we know yet? Well, I thought she she's was on, a, on the Cape. A life quest is what I've been saying. You've been keep saying life quest. I don't think it's a life quest. I, I think she's just visiting friends I thought and it was family a family on the vacation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but fear not. We have the one and only Genevieve with us. So, Ali Genevieve. There was something about Allie, Amanda, and Derek just rang off. You're really ruining it. Derek. I know. There were a lot of A's. Genevieve. Yeah, Addison, Allie, too. Yeah. Addison, yeah. Should I change my name? Is that possible? Maybe. Would you do that for sure. us? Sure. I'll look into it. Okay. Cool. All right, anyways, uh, the team is here. Uh, we have an excellent episode lined up for y'all. Uh, also, we have a great week. Uh, we have Gina Kirschenheider from the Real Housewives of Orange County is with us. Uh, excited to talk about Gina. We'll get a little uh, inside scoop of some of the tea drama, uh, all the things going on in the current season of... Uh, Real Housewives of Orange County. Like, excited to talk with her. Also, we have our recap, uh, Breaking Down Charity Season, with a uh, special guest yet to be named, but it's going to be exciting. Anyways, um, so we're with you there tomorrow. Also, you know, the batch recaps are going to be really just going to be more freestyle slash batch recaps because we, you know, we just love talking about all the other things going on in the world. We don't want li- to limit ourselves to pitch nick our idea you one of idea. our right ideas now? on the right show now? sure yeah. yeah i've been gone for a while well we were thinking because we cover so much now bachelor vanderpump all things reality tv uh-huh. love what island if us is starting soon it from a bachelor recap to a reality recap okay that was reality, one of our ideas. Reality recap. Yeah. He loves it. Okay. Yeah. More that all enthusiasm. encompassing title. No, I like that. And it's working title, but I, yes, I think we're on the same You don't page. like the alliteration? Yeah. Reality recap? Yeah. Re- okay. Yeah. Reality recap. Great. R&R. Well, oh, that was oh. so easy. Great. All right. So item number two on the list. <laughs> uh, any, uh, anything else? I'll pull up my notes for a raise later. or something. Yeah. That's on the bottom. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Before we uh, get to our callers, uh, any, so wait, it's, it's, it's Thursday, the week the week before. A lot still going on with the Jonah Hill of it all scandal. Forgetting about the Jonah Hill and the surfer, uh, his ex girlfriend. I guess forgetting about the people involved and all that stuff. I I am very fascinated by this story in the sense that I, I think you know so much of our show is trying to take from what we see in pop culture in the real world and try to you know break it down, discuss it, and 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 apply it to real life dating. Obviously, especially. When it comes to the this this particular show, Ask Nick, we get to hear people's stories and apply, you know, these concepts that we see on the internet and in life and on the show. And I think, you know, the biggest outcome of this Jonah Hill story was the weaponization of therapy speak. A lot of a lot of articles have been written about it. I find it almost comical that this story is what catapulted this conversation on the topic of weaponizing therapy speak because if you've listened to this show you have known that i have been beating this drum since i can remember because you know while jonah hell seems to have been whether intentionally or not weaponizing therapy speak and misusing the term boundaries it doesn't stop there anytime someone misuses the term gaslighting or diagnoses someone over the internet as a narcissist or an abuser, you know, again, there are real, there are terrible forms of real victims of abuse out there. You know, there are actual narcissists, there are people being gaslit, you know, there are people being love bombed. And yet now, because the internet and therapy has taken off in the best possible way we are educating ourselves, you know, and I think probably for most cases, well-intentioned to, you know, we want to learn and then we want to apply what we learn to the real world, but we also, we have to be careful using these terms because it doesn't do anyone good watering down the meaning of these words. When it comes to abuse, uh, the biggest thing is a pattern, a consistent pattern and intent. You know, the intent of, for example, you know, not take, you know, someone could, let's say, try to in, attempt to set a boundary with the best of intentions, you know, putting J- Jonah Hill aside, but let's say someone's dating a club promoter, you know, they fell in love, they went to the they went to One Oak one night and some club promoter, just cute, cute, cute guy, just, oh, wow, what a charming guy. And 
he just comes across as the exception of the rule. But yeah, I'm a club promoter, but I want to get married someday. He's a well-intentioned fuck boy. And then then she falls in love with the club promoter. It's his literal job. It's his literal job to DM, slide in the DMs of hot, attractive women and take them out to dinner and party with them all night. That is their, that is the job of a club promoter. Their job. And yet imagine someone dating that club promoter, this feeling uncomfortable and has learned about boundary setting and expectations and says, I don't want you to do that anymore. And yet, you know, apples to apples, That'd be the same premise of, well, wait, if you knew they were a club promoter, like you're literally, you're, you're, literally, you're asking them not to do their job. I mean, you have the right to be uncomfortable with it, but you don't know so you have the right to tell someone to not do their job. And as, as we learned through the Jonah Hill story is that what was the problem with what Jonah Hill was doing, he wasn't setting a boundary. Boundaries you set for yourself, as we've talked about on the show over and over, you know, and it's a little bit of semantics because had Jonah Hill, for example, not said, you can't hang out with them. These are my boundaries for you. You can't hang out with these people. You can't surf with guys. You can't wear bathing suits. That's more control. Those are rules he was trying to apply into his relationship. A version of Jonah Hill setting a boundary in that scenario would have been saying, hey, listen, a boundary I've set for myself is I don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable or, or put myself in situations where my anxiety is triggered or my insecurities are triggered. So that's just a rule I have for myself. And I'm realizing through some of the things that you're doing, I'm getting myself in situations that are triggering my anxiety. So I might need to step away. If he said, had said it like that. Because he needs to make it a him thing, not just put it directly on It's his personal her. rule yeah. of saying, this is, I, I, this is a boundary I've set for myself that I have to hold myself accountable. I might have to communicate to my partner as opposed to saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Again, Jonah Hill aside, there are plenty of versions that we've all been in relationships where we've mis- you know, misapplied a certain rule, liking bathing, you know, liking it models on Instagram. We hear that all the time. It's like my boyfriend's liking this, or they're out with their friends all the time. You know, like so the difference between a rule and a boundary. You know, again, a boundary would be I don't want to be with someone who talks down to me. I don't want to be with someone who makes me feel bad for not being okay with them flirting with the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. Like that's different than trying to set a rule for your partner. I mean, we all have rules. We have been abusing therapy talk and weaponizing therapy talk since therapy talk has really taken off. Like it's just as dangerous to accuse someone as being a narcissist. We now live in a world. If you're friends with someone or dating someone and they are considering their needs before you or being selfish in a, in, in a situation, uh, they're a narcissist. They're a self-centered, egomaniac narcissist. But when we do it, when we put our needs before ourselves, then we are just being the main characters in our own story. We are just empowering ourselves to, you know, finally put ourselves first. And I just, I, I do think in, a, is in general, we have a more narcissistic world. You know, we are, we have a main character epidemic. Everything on the internet is telling us, you know, why, you know, we need, we need to expect more for ourselves and less from other people. Yeah, and I think it's a balance. I, so I, but I think this story is hopefully a helpful one that I do think we need to be, again, more careful about weaponizing uh, therapy speak, about actually doing the work and looking at yourself before you look at others in terms of what can you improve in your relationships. It's just kind of interesting. But again, boundary setting is not making a rule for your other partner. It is not telling them what they can do. It is communicating rules that you have for yourself and then trying to articulate that to a partner. And it is semantic. It is a fine line between the two. Because in that version of Jonah Hill saying, hey, listen, in past relationships, I felt like, he, and I don't know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm role playing here, but he, but he could have said, listen, in past relationships, I felt like my trust was taken for granted, that my trust was used against me. And that resulted in me being cheated on, or that resulted in trusting my partner only for them to put themselves in situations where it really triggered my insecurities. It really triggered my jealousy. So I just set a personal boundary that I just want to put myself in healthy situations. And I just want to communicate that to you. And I know this is your job, but how can we figure out if we, you know, assuming we want to be in this relationship, how can we figure out not to trigger my anxiety? And then it becomes a team effort rather than you, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, you can't do that. I don't want to see your I don't want to see you doing thong. this. Because it's such Have a, a great yeah. fulfilling life as a model. Yeah. You're going to love it. He sounded like an 18-year-old who finally went to therapy and 
and, and was trying to apply these terms, you know, and probably feeling good about himself. Hey, I've learned all this stuff. I've invested in the therapy and now I want to apply it. You know, does that make it, you know, I, I just think we need to be more careful when we throw out words like narcissist and abuser. For a guy who was accused of being a misogynistic, him and his girlfriend at the time were matching outfits to an Os Oscar party. It's not very misogynistic. I mean, it sounds very... He slayed. Play. Yeah. kind of slayed. I hate to say it. I, no, yeah. it was great. <laughs> but it, that's like the opposite of being like, no, I won't dress like my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Anyway, I just, we need to be like, I just think we need to take from these stories and, and try to learn from them rather than trying to assess who's the good person, who's the, who's the bad person in the story. The more I look at the story, specifically around his ex-girlfriend, you know, the other accusation about that party, pretty gross if it's true, really unfortunate, problematic. I don't know. There's nothing to learn from that. Don't do shit like that at, uh, with people who are underage. Pretty, pretty yucky. But as far as the surfer girlfriend, it just sounds like a toxic relationship of two people who wanted to make it work, but clearly saw life in relationships. And they sound like they also had different value systems. That's the thing, too, about like setting boundaries. You know, someone can might come from a more conservative point of view, you know, where, you know, hanging out with the opposite sex or wearing certain clothes is, you know, the Kiki Palmer story where her her partner was criticizing what she was wearing. It doesn't make it okay, but we can have different value systems where, hey, we, we're on the same page when it comes to what's appropriate and what we wear, or how we incorporate sex into our dating lives and our conversations. And so, you know, I rather than demonize people. though, because it's like, I think. It's confusing because he didn't go into the relationship saying those things. Sure. I know, like, I'm not having his actions yeah. so vastly change from hard eye emoji and liking these photos to then turn around once they're in a relationship and well, just those... hate them completely and say, take them down and, yeah. and make it her fault no, it and blame hypocr- her. It seems it's, hypocritical. It's such a quick like switch to flip. But we also, you know, as a single person, we act differently than we do in relationships. And, you know, I'm sure he realized that she would be perceived differently once she was romantically tied to him. Like you saw that Dylan yeah. O'Brien situation where he got a girlfriend and within 10 minutes, people dug up, you know, not so great tweets of hers from 10 sure. years ago. Yeah. Like there, you, he just could have phrased it in a different way where be like, hey, we're under a lot of scrutiny. Exactly. If you wouldn't I, mind. It's, yeah. the, it's the language. Exactly. Oh, totally. It could have been pitched completely differently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine like, you know. Nally models on the side. She's a beautiful woman. Like she's very comfortable with her body. I love that she's comfortable with her body. I have a different value system apparently than Jonah Hill. Like I, I wasn't about to date her and then try to like dim change her, everything about her, dim her yeah. light, so to speak. You know, but we do. Uh, you know, I'm not Jonah Hill, but we definitely had conversations around like optics. You know, and putting. You know, and not, I was like, I don't care what you do, but I just, I don't want you to be, I, these people are vicious. They look for things. They're mean. They're cruel. They're, they troll you. And so, yeah, it's, you're having conversations about, you know, being careful, always be, con- you know, when you, when you don't have a uh, social media following, you're kind of posting whatever, you, you know, other than like maybe your job finding out or something like that. People don't give much thought into it as opposed to people watching your ever move and dissecting it, and criticizing it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just think. If we're a world where we're trying to find more human connections and we're trying to make dating more successful and we're trying to fall in love and have healthy relationships, I don't think we're doing ourselves any good by demonizing each other. Like this idea that, you know, I've, I saw stuff or comments or tweets about like, oh, now men are only getting into therapy to use it against. It's just like, no, pe- people can be shitty. People mm-hmm. can be manipulative. People can be condescending abusive, narcissistic, you know, and I think we live in a world where we should try to find ways to unite rather than divide. I mean, I know I'm preaching we live in a divided world right now, but I I think these stories can be helpful if we want to see them as helpful more than just gossip and critiquing and taking sides and things like that. That's my two cents on the story, but fascinating nonetheless. Hopefully you can learn, learn from it. Hopefully you all have learned as much as we talk about boundaries. It, is a fi- it, it was a reminder for me. I mean, even in my book, I talk about how a boundary is something for you and not for your partner. But yet, you know, when you read it, you're thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe they were trying to do this or trying to do that. So it's, just, it's, oh, it's always a good reminder because we can learn things, try to apply them and then realize, wait, I have to go back and readjust, you know, mm-hmm. because we can kind of get too confident in ourselves. And then we can like lose some of the details and the nuances of how things should be applied and things like that. So 
Anywho, uh, I know we have, uh, do you have a, a written? I do. Before we get to our caller? We got a, an email that says, today I listened to the episode, I'm dating a bad kisser. And one of the other callers was talking about how they hate their brother's girlfriend. Quote, she's stealing him from the family, et cetera, et cetera. I thought the advice was spot on. Love and support him, hype him up, et cetera. I know my boyfriend's family feels similarly t- about me to how this girl that called in feels. However, I'm not the enemy. I'd never ask or tell my boyfriend to not spend time or talk with his family. That's an insane ask. What I do know is that he has had trauma with his family and he's come into his own in the past two years while we've been dating, taking time for himself, making more time to maintain friendships that he values, working hard at work to get what he wants. What his family views is that since he met me, he is, quote, distanced from the family, not driving two hours to his parents' home every weekend and not himself, a.k.a. bending to their every whim. My question would be, how do I, the bad guy, try to communicate to his sisters that it's not me, it's him, he is growing up, and he makes his own decisions? Because right now they think I tell him not to do things, and that is absolutely not the case. Interesting. When it comes to this family stuff, it's always, it's his responsibility. Mm-hmm. So my first, if she, my first question to her is, is he communicating this to them? Is he saying to his family, to his sisters, to his parents, whoever it is that, you know, it's like, hey, I'm the reason, not her, you know, and families can believe what they want. They go, oh, you're, well, you know, you're just saying that or, you know, whatever. To a certain point, she can't do anything about it. And depending on the level of toxicity of the family or how controlling they might be, to some point, she should just shouldn't care. But if she truly is like, hey, trying to be supportive and there and, and he's, he's choosing to separate himself from the family for whatever reason. Sometimes you just get older, you move away, you just like call home less. Mm-hmm. You know, it's nice. sometimes two it's hours simple. away, that's far. But it's also possible too, if he has been single for a while and he, you know, let's say he did have a bad relationship with his family or he was, he knew that there was faults in it, but he was very lonely and he was like, well, I guess this is all I have to do is go home. Maybe he's found someone he really loves and cares about that's helped illuminate that to him and say, hey, I've noticed this pattern. When you spend time with them, you end up anxious, you get down on yourself, you're very depressed. So, yeah, maybe that was always there and she's just kind of helped him be able to stand on his own two feet, but now she's getting the blame. There's nothing she can say to them, the family, because no matter what she says, they'll either choose to believe it or not. What if she says, oh, what is she going to say? No, I'm not the one who's telling him not to do it. He just doesn't want to see you. <laughs> he hates you. you know, <laughs> Sorry, they're gonna, mom. They're going to be like, oh, you're just, they're not going to believe that. They can just choose not to believe it. So the only conversation she needs to have is with her partner. Mm-hmm. And that partner is, hey, I've noticed it feels like, you know, hey, I don't really care. I mean, every girlfriend I ever had, to their credit, always did a good, like, I've always been an independent person. I'm close with my family. I love my family, but, like, I'm just kind of more independent. Most of the women I've dated did a good job of being like, hey, we should go visit your family or, you know, we should, you know. So it was them almost encouraging to spend quality time with my family at times. Not always, but they did a good job of making sure we would do that. So she can do that. She could say to her boyfriend, how about we go visit your family? And that's just, that's, that's, that's helping him get more face time with his family. She could take it a step further and say, it feels like your family is blaming me for our disconnect. I want to be close with your family, as close as you want me to be. And, you know, can you say something to them? Because if he has a conversation with his family and say, hey, listen, like, it's not her, it's me. You know, and whatever reason he wants to say, you know, to be honest, like, I get anxious when I get home or I just need my space from you guys, but it's not her. I'm my own person. I'd appreciate you not blaming her. You know, if we have shit to work on, let's work on it. But like, I'm making my own decisions. He could say that. And that has a better chance of coming across than if sh- her saying it. And those are the only things, two things she can do. Like all she has, all she can do is just encourage him to involve his family in his life to the point at which he feels comfortable. And if he says, well, listen, I just have certain boundaries when it comes to my family because of past instances where I just kind of keep my space. I'm sorry that they're blaming you, but ultimately I don't care. You know, because if I, you know, I have a large family and I, all, all my, my family is great. But if let's say I had a particular sibling that was mean to my partner and challenging my partner or cruel or to my partner, A, a I would probably say something. But at some point I would just say to my partner, like now it's just like, I don't care. You don't need to care. Mm-hmm. It's not going to change our relationship. I give a fuck what they act like. I can't control them. I can tell them to stop, but they're not going to. 
So I don't care. So she needs to get reassurance from him. Totally. Because there's probably a fear there, too. Like maybe one day he'll look up and believe his family and then I'll be on the outs. The only thing that's not adding up is why why isn't he stepping up? Mm -hmm. Is this is her partner someone who is more passive and more demure and he is used to being bullied by his family? And even though she is not thinking she's bullying or anything, but maybe she's more of an alpha personality, more of a kind of a boss personality and just their personality from a matching stamp. Maybe he is just kind of drawn to people who are more outspoken, who are more kind of uh, expressive and 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 maybe she is doing that more than she realizes. And I wonder, too, because she said uh, that they're thinking he's not himself in parentheses, a.k.a. bending to their every whim. If he was so used to just bending to every whim, it might feel like a huge shift for him to just not do that right now or to like just avoid them. That might feel like a big step, let alone getting to the point of like being outspoken and telling them how he feels and defending his girlfriend. Like he might just need a little bit more time if he was so used to doing everything their way. And if he's now in this middle territory. Yeah, it's going to be an even bigger transition to be like, and now you must tell them all how you feel and stand up for me. But maybe, yeah, maybe he's a more of a passive guy. And without her realizing it, 90 percent of what they do are her decisions. Maybe she's the planner, you know, and he's just kind of along for the ride, you know, but there he needs to take more ownership of this relationship with his family Agreed. and her. And all she can do is talk to him about it, but he needs to do it. She can't make him do it, you know, and if she's noticing that's the case, maybe he needs to step up more or maybe she needs to reevaluate her involvement. But the only thing I'm certain of is she shouldn't go to the family and try to explain to them why she's not the problem. Yeah, that might make it worse. That will that never goes yeah. over well. Anyway. All right. Well, we have a great show for you lined up. Don't forget to send those questions at asknick at com. On Thursday, I'm going deeper. We have Gina Kirschenheiner from Real Housewives of Orange County and our recapping our reality recap including uh charities episode four. A lot to get into uh this week. Excited to have you with us. Better date than never on Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget to check out Vile Files Plus for all your additional update specials. When are we dropping a Vanderpump? Uh, we will be recording our first one this week. So next I week. I believe it'll be, yeah, we'll figure out a drop date, but we'll be recording Thursday it this week. Thursday or Friday next week, we'll be recapping episodes one through three of season one. Yeah. Uh, so get ready. It's here, everybody. For all your... Uh, <laughs> Your, He's your, been hyping your it up Vanderpump since the day it was season. born. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it'll be out next week, so be sure to check it out. Uh, Vile Files Plus, it's free to sign up, seven-day free trial. Let's go to vilefiles.com. Uh, it's on the first page. You just hit, hit a button, and then you sign up. It's real easy. You can listen to the episodes the same way you listen to uh, the Vile Files. It's Classic. Great. Classic. Mm -hmm. Also, Vile Files Plus, for all your update specials, we have another update special dropping this Friday for Vile File Plus listeners only. I know y'all love those updates because those updates on a classic crush. So you are missing out. So just check out our updates on Vile Files Plus. It's free to sign up. We have one this Friday. There are so many good ones available. Uh, so many stories that you have not been updated on. So check it out. And all right, let's get to our callers. What's your time with Nick? Let's ask Nick your sexy questions. How's it going? Hi. My name is Noelle and I'm 25. How can we help Noelle? So I'm calling in because my father-in-law is berating me in front of our family members. Okay. Yeah. Bummer. It's really frustrating. I, I'm calling in because I don't know what to do. Well, okay. Well, it's, I'll, I don't know if I'll be able to help, but we'll do our best. Um, give us an example. Like give, set, set up the scene. So every time that I go over to their house, he the first thing he does when he sees me is says oh man like i just so wish that i we saw you more boy you're never here and context for that is that my husband and i are the only of the the only ones of the 10 siblings that like don't spend like every waking second over there even the married ones your husband has 10 siblings um he has nine siblings so oh. he's one of the 10 okay that 
um, yeah, so everyone else, half of them are married, half aren't, and they all basically live over there with their spouses practically. We're the only ones that don't. When you say practically, you don't mean literally. You mean... No, they don't live over there, but they we all live in a similar area, like sure. close together. And so they like eat over there all together. You live in the same meal. kind of city and county neighborhood, yada, yada. Correct. And, and, yes. and grandma and grandpa's place is like home base for everyone to come in and out of. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Yes. So right. we're the ones that are not doing that, at least not on an everyday basis, you know, for obvious reasons we'll get into. And so I, he says that to me so often that I thought I was going to have a really good comeback in that moment. Um, so I went over there. I knew he was going to say it. Sure enough, he did. And I said, well, the road drives both ways. And I thought that was a great comeback. He didn't talk to me for the rest of the night because I like apparently set him off or something. Well, we were at a community gathering, just like, like it was, it had to have been two weeks later. And he comes and finds me for the first time since that conversation and says to me in his joking, like asterisk, oh, it's so funny sort of a way, uh, which isn't funny of basically that he um, has been thinking about what I said and that boy, it was just, boy, I'm just a really mouthy daughter-in-law. And he, I, I reminded him of somebody who should have a spanking. Wait, wait what? <laughs> Record he scratch. <laughs> and he said to you, I, you remind me of someone who needs a spanking? That's ex verbatim. And he thought it was funny. And he not only said it to me, he said it in front of my sister-in-law and like other people in our family and thought it was funny and they should all laugh. And they were all just like pretended like they didn't hear it. And I just, I was so dumbfounded that I just like excused myself. How old is and he? And walked he's away. Like 70, 80? No, he's 55. 55. Is your husband like one of the oldest? Yes. All right. So he said he needed a spanking. Okay. That's weird. Yes. Um, yeah. Super uncomfortable. And what did your husband say? So my husband wasn't there in that moment. Okay. And but I'm sure you told so him. I, yeah, I, I told him about it afterwards. And he was really upset about it. And he actually went to my father-in-law. The story gets better here. So he went to my father-in-law and approached him about it and said, you may not speak to my wife that way. That was super hurtful and very inappropriate. And with the way that you're communicating right now, we're heading to a situation where we aren't going to have a relationship. Is that what you want? Okay. And left him to think about that. Okay, great. And so, yeah, so then my husband went off to work. And we own our own heavy construction business, which is part of the backstory. Um, and then my my father-in-law proceeds to get into, I found this out afterwards. Um, he, he proceeds to get in his car. He drives over to my house. We live about a mile and a half away. He comes and walks into my house and spends 30 seconds, like giving me a half-ass apology. And then spends the next 15 minutes telling me why the relationship problems are mine and my husband's fault and why we don't communicate and we're so selfish and we only think about ourselves and we're not um, like for the better, for bettering of the whole family. And we are too like off on our own and we just need to be a part of the group. And yeah, it was just, oh, it was so frustrating because of like, he's the one that caused, I mean, in my, like from my perspective, like he's the one causing all of the relational issues. And then he's, he gives me this half-ass apology and then pretends like my husband and I are the problem. And then he, I, I know he speaks to all of his, my husband's siblings, like my husband and I are the problem and kind of talks down about us to them and then tells us that, oh, he loves us and he doesn't play favorites and we're all the same. And that is just, that is not true at all. And I don't know how to even communicate with him. He's just like pissing me off so much that I don't, I don't even want to be in the same room with him. And then I think, am I like overreacting to this? What was the backstory? Why do you, and what, tell me why you think like the origin story of this is with the heavy construction business. Yeah. So my husband grew up on a big family farm and he I'll always imagined that he would be farming. I think that's the way that his dad kind of always saw it happening. His dad's super controlling, grew up in a really controlling household. Um, and when, when we got older, once we were married, um, last summer, uh, my husband had the opportunity to start this heavy construction business. It went absolutely bonkers, like blew up right away. And it was just fantastic. And things were already like 
not healthy and kind of controlling and there wasn't a lot of direction. So my husband was really happy to have something else to do. And since then, my father-in-law has like continued to go off the deep end as our business has got has gotten more successful, he's gotten worse and worse. And one of the things he said to me when he came over is he's like, I'm not going to take no for an answer. Like we have to work together. And if, um, if you like your business is selfish and you only have your own business because you guys are selfish and you don't want to work with the family business to like help everyone be better. And, What's the family business? Um, is farming. Okay. He doesn't yeah. want to farm. No. Well, he doesn't want to farm with his dad. He doesn't want to farm with him. He's like, they have totally def different definitions of success. My father-in-law is super controlling, tries to tell him what to do all the time. My husband is obviously really skilled and has started this whole business from scratch that is super successful. And, and he doesn't, like he said somewhere maybe in the future, he would be interested in farming, but not with his dad and not if he's going to act like this. So this, the, the, the relationship problem is, if there's a problem, it seems like between you and, your husband and your father, and you're just kind of collateral damage. Sounds like. I think so. I think my father-in-law blames me to a certain extent for my husband maybe. having the kahunas to leave. Yeah, maybe. You might be a convenient excuse. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know either. The, the most important thing, it sounds like your, your husband has no problem standing up to your father-in-law. He doesn't. I think, I don't know. My husband is so busy with his business. I don't know that he necessarily, like, wants to take the emotional time to deal with this as much as I would wish that he would. Why, you know? why, what, what do you wish he would do? That is a really good question. I don't know. I, I just, it just hurts so much to have this be going down the way that it sure. is. And I mean, as like a Midwestern family, like we're really, um, like families are really close mm -hmm. here, you know, and I, my husband and I have been together for like, you know, which is going to sound funny, but I mean, nine years, I mean, I was 16 when we got together. I feel like I know this family sure. like so well. And so to see it all like go to crap like this, what are the rest what he's doing is so frustrating. What about, what about mom-in-law or the other siblings? Yeah. So mom-in-law is mortified. I can tell not because she says it, but because her actions say that she's mortified. But honestly, I don't think that she, I think she's kind of been bulldozed their entire relationship. I don't think it's her practice to stand up to him in any situations, which is really sad. And then I can tell that none of my husband's siblings, when the rubber meets the road, are on our team. Like they're all controlled and all work for, or somehow are connected to my father-in-law, he's very controlling, very, and he uses, he's, he runs a successful business and he uses his money to control his kids by giving them money or facilitating opportunities for them to mm -hmm. make more money so that they continue to do what he wants them to do. And the fact that my husband and I built this business without his money and without his facilitation makes it even worse because he can't control it. Worse for him, but better for you. Right. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah. It's just really painful to see like all everybody else that I thought we were really close. Like, oh, I'm sorry, but like, I'm going to side with dad. What do you mean side with, what, like, how so? Like, they're like, yeah. They, they, they don't think he's doing anything wrong. Like, they don't see that he's controlling or rude or they all just blow it off. Okay, but what do you mean by, I? so like, they, they think he should storm into your house and, and blame you? Oh, they wouldn't believe me if I told them that. They would, they would say that I was in my feelings and I was taking that out of context and that isn't what he intended to do. And if he made me feel that way, he would feel terrible about it. I think you need to focus on the battle and not the war, so to speak. Yeah. I, I think... Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, as an isolated incident, incident no one's going to... It doesn't seem like anyone's disagreeing that uh, saying that you need a spanking was appropriate. You think that they wouldn't believe you if he did, yada, yada, but... Right. Well, I he think, told me when I wore leather pants one time that I looked like a stripper. Yeah, I mean, that tracks, right? I mean, so, like, yeah. we know who this guy is, right? He's an old school, old fashioned, super conservative. You know, he's literally created his own little universe and he's God, you know, in his mind. 100%. Right? Yeah. Like, this is, this is, is the right. who this man is. And that's like, kind of like you said, he was probably raised that way. And now it's his turn, it's his family. It, you know, this is who this guy is, right? So you right. going around and trying to convince all his other kids that he's some sort of selfish prick is is a probably mm -hmm. a war you're you're not gonna win, right? 
But and that's yeah. that's the war. The battle, right, is the mm-hmm. isolated incident where he says and does some fucked up shit where anyone in their right not mind would be like, Yeah, that's a boundary you probably shouldn't cross, grandpa. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like you are going to run into roadblocks, as it sounds like you already have, by going around and be like, Your dad's so fucking selfish. Can't you see it? Can't you see <laughs> yeah. what he's doing to you? Can't you see yada yada yada? Mm-hmm. Like it's not that easy to start a sick it's not that easy to start any business, let alone a successful business, let alone a business that blows up uh, very successfully overnight. So there's so many other var- variables that you have to consider with your husband's siblings. You know, like I'm sure mm-hmm. in their own way, they're happy for you, but they all probably would love the independence that your husband has carved out for himself, but they haven't done that. Yeah. Now, there's a variety of reasons yep. why they haven't done that. I don't know. Maybe they don't have the fortitude, the intelligence, the guts. Who knows, right? But Mm-hmm. They aren't in the position that your husband is. And so, yeah, they are a bit handcuffed to sit there and be like, you know, not only their dad, but their boss mm-hmm. and their lifeline to sit there and like take your side. What What's in it for them, so to speak. Right. So you're kind of yeah. getting you're kind of asking them something that is difficult for them to take your side on. And mm-hmm. I, I think you should kind of take a, a page out of your husband's book. Like, you know, you're not going to change this guy. You can still have a relationship with this guy. You know, you might not have the type of relationship you had fantasized for yourself. You know, when thinking about the type mm-hmm. of closeness I want with my father-in-law and yada, yada, yada. But like, you know, this is just who he is. I'm sure he has some charming characteristics you know, like, but like just accepting who he is, yeah. have your boundaries. Which is so irritating because uh, uh, those uh, are the ones that like uh, surface okay. level people see and they're like, oh, your father in law's so nice. What a nice guy. I'm like, if you only knew. What you, you are hanging on to things that are just driving you crazy and, and it's, it's not getting you anywhere. You, you have known your husband and his family since you were 16. I, you know what I'm saying? Like you didn't have to marry the guy. And I'm, I, yeah. So. It's not appropriate that he said that to you, and it's not appropriate that he comes into your house. So it is, as always, set the boundaries for yourself and you and your husband's relationship with your father-in-law that you deem appropriate. Stand your ground. Don't let him bully you, and don't let him make you feel like you're wrong. Just say, like, listen, I, I'm sorry you feel the way you do. We love the company that we have. We love you, and you're not going to take no for an answer. It's just like, well, okay, well. <laughs> Good luck with that, you know, like, yeah, we're not going to give you what you want. And eventually he's just going to, ex- this guy is used to getting what he's want- he wants. He's going to be persistent. Oh, yeah. He's going to be persistent. You just got to ignore him. You're not ignoring him. You are letting him get to you, right? Your husband's ignoring him. Your husband's like, you know what? Fuck it. This is my dad's. This is going to be my dad. I'm just going to ignore the motherfucker. I love him. But like, I just don't have time to put up with my dad's little temper tantrums. <laughs> exactly what he's doing That's so like i'm just gonna go yeah. about my way and you're sitting here and be like you know what no i'm gonna let it piss me off i'm gonna let it get to me i'm gonna let it fester inside me and i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna try mm-hmm. to go to all his kids and try to change their mind about who their father is it's a mm-hmm. you're not gonna get very far you know right. i think i will say i haven't really we haven't I haven't gone around to like my husband's siblings and tried to like convince them of I, my uh, perspective. I haven't even told them what happened when he came to my house or what he said, other sure. than the ones that were that heard it. I haven't even told them, but I just I can see in their body language and in their eyes yeah. and the way that they interact that they are sensing that things are uncomfortable and they I know they're not like I can imagine that yeah. they're not going to yeah. side with me. You know what I mean? The good news is yeah, is that which, you you guys are which is independent. Why I'm glad we got out. Yeah. Like we're the ones that are on like our own and, and my husband and I are, are slowly like working towards like we would like to move away. Um, our our business is more regional, like the in the area we do business, so we don't have to live right here. But obviously, like everything's kinda happened really quickly. And so we're hoping in the next year to move so that things like him driving over aren't an option as easily sure. for him and things like that. Um, but obviously like in the meantime, um, it just feels like very invasive. I know my husband said he cornered him last week too, and was like, um, basically just saying the same things over and over again of like, I just can't take no for an answer. And I don't, I mean, I just don't think your business is going to do well and you're going to be coming back basically. (laughs) Well, I'm sure your husband is going to use that as motivation, you know, to, to prove his dad wrong. Right. So yeah, I appreciate why, how frustrating it can be. I really, I really do. 
and I'm sorry you're going through that. I think the best thing you can do is be in a united front with your husband, talk about mm -hmm. the boundaries, thank your husband for standing up for you and making sure that you guys are a united front. That That's what matters most, that you mm -hmm. and your husband are on the same page. You know, like, uh, you'd be in a real pickle if if you were on an yeah. island and your husband wasn't seeing this as an issue and wasn't defending you and and wasn't you know standing up to his dad and saying hey you can't speak to to my wife that way. Certainly, a lot of people out there have a hard time standing up to their parents, and thankfully, your husband is not one of them. I mean, clearly, his this is the origin story of all this is your husband saying I don't I don't I want to be my own person. I want to have my own thing. I yeah. want to you know yeah. uh, my husband's a stud. Like, yeah, uh, I'm crazy about him. He was a good choice. That's awesome. Yeah. So focus on the positive. Don't let like you're, you're just you're just letting this the guy just drive you nuts. So one my other question then is I know that my father, -in -law, well, my husband is really good at like ignoring it or not. I know that it is really hurtful to him, like in sure. his heart, you know, and so to obviously not have your parent support is like really sucky. And so do you have any advice as far as like the best way to go about like encouraging my husband or helping him work through the fact that like his dad is not only not supportive, so, but actively like against what we're doing? Your husband's still young. Your, your, your father-in-law is still relatively young. Just support him. Tell him all the time how proud you are of him. Give him what he's missing from his dad. What he wants from his dad is the support. And he wants to hear from his father how proud he is of his son for like carving out his own path, right? But right now, mm -hmm. dad's being self-centered and only thinking about what dad wants. And he's thinking about his dreams or what he imagined for himself and his business and his family and yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. And so be for your husband what his dad is not being for him. And that is telling him over and over just how proud you are of him, how much you believe in him, how like we're a team. We can do this. Like we're going to have our ups and downs, mm -hmm. be his cheerleader, you know, do that. that more than anything. I think that's the important thing and empathize with him when he needs, you know, when he needs empathy in terms of like his relationship with his dad. But I, I I'd be careful about using language about like, you know, you still have a relationship with dad, you know, dad still mm -hmm. as, as much as st st father-in-law, it might be fairly toxic and misguided, but he loves probably both of you. You know, he's just also self-centered and selfish. You know, he just he's mm -hmm. having a hard time seeing through this. But it's not because dad mm -hmm. doesn't love your your husband or or you. Mm -hmm. He just wants it his own way. So don't tell yourself I don't have a relationship with my father. Just I don't have the relationship I want to have right now. Uh, as always, I say like kill him with kindness. You know, I still love you. If you will still welcome us to the birthdays and the Easter's and the Christmases and the holidays, we'll be there. You know, we'll put up probably with your bullshit and your sarcastic remarks and your, you know, comments under your breath and yada. You have to let that not bother you. You have to focus on we are doing what we want to do. We are living our dreams. We have the independence we've always desired. We have it all. We truly have mm -hmm. it all. You know, the only thing that comes with is this like kind of annoying father-in-law who, you know, constantly wants us to remind us that we're not doing what he thinks we should do. And, you know, you're not going to get his support right now. Give it five or 10 years. I know that seems like an eternity probably right now, but like, you just never know. And your husband can just say, you know, sorry, you feel that way, dad. I love you. I'm sorry. you feel that way, dad. I love you. Some version of that. I wish I had your support, but either way, I love you. Don't fight fire with fire, so to speak. Just, you know, fight it with love, not to sound cheesy, but just don't let the bully know that you're, he's getting to you. Just say, Hey, I, you know, I'm sorry. Again, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I do love you. And, and if you, if you need my help, I'm here to help, but like, I have a business to run and maybe someday we can work together, but these are, this is my life and these are my dreams. And this is what I do for my family. And, and you know, you guys can move and mom and, you know, he'll throw a fit about that too and whatever and mm -hmm. try to make you feel guilty and make, you know, feel shame and yada, yada. But that's just, that's just him projecting his fears and not getting what he wants. So you just have to, you have to see it for what it is. And then you mm -hmm. have to not let it get to you. You have to not, because all you reacting is giving what him what he wants. He wants a reaction, mm -hmm. you know? He wants me to feel off balance and uncomfortable yes. and all you're, the time. And you're, he has the high ground then. Yeah. So just don't let him get to you. Mm -hmm. Just be like, okay, all right. Just see him yeah. as a petulant child that he kind of is. 
You don't answer yeah. to him. You don't need anything from him. You're not financially like reliant on him. Like you, there is no reason for you to react to his behavior mm-hmm. other than like the principle of it. And right. you just have, you have to get off that. You really do. I mean, you don't have to, but it, I should, I should. It, it'll, and I think will help your mental health if you can, if, yeah. if you can kind of follow your husband's lead when it comes to, to that department, M- maybe he'll come around. So in like the effort of like, you know, like my mental health and like boundaries, like one of the things I've thought about and thought about implementing, I'm just like curious, like when I go over there and my husband isn't there is when I really feel vulnerable because I feel like nobody's on my team in the sense of like, if he says like, you know, don't go over there. things or whatever. And so that's my thing is I'm like, okay, well then is it is a healthy boundary to be like, well, I don't go over there unless my husband is with me, you know, like unless we're a unit where we're not over there if he's there. Um, yeah, like, I mean, over like, the top or I, I think if you can go there, maybe a couple more times, give it a shot. We probably know what's going to happen. Right. And you can just say, please don't speak to me that way. You've got to always keep your composure. Like, I don't appreciate you talking that way. If you're going to keep talking that way, I'm just like, you, you make me feel uncomfortable. Just, just name it. You're making me feel uncomfortable. I want to be here, but I don't want to feel uncomfortable when I'm here. So like, if you can't stop making these comments, I guess I'm just not going to come. And he claims yeah. he wants you around. He wants the family together. So give him a choice, just like you kind of would a child. You know, it's just like, hey, if you don't clean your room, you're not going to get the cookie. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Truly. Yeah. I just think you kind of imagine him being a little boy. Because that's what he is right now. He's just acting like a little boy. He's just kind of going to his like childlike state, throwing a temper tantrum and just see him for what he is and set that mm-hmm. boundary. And then, yeah, if he doesn't comply, then you just say, well, I'm not I'm just going to unfortunately be here less. And then let him know that it makes you sad because all overall, I love being around your family. I love your family and I love you, but I don't like the way you make me feel. And I am sorry our choices are frustrating to you, but they are our choices. and. You can either respect them or not, but we're not going to mm-hmm. feel disrespected even in your own house. Man, I need to write this down. I <laughs> wish, like, I have, like all these things to say, like when it's not in the moment. Like, it's hard. It's I know. Like that. I know. Because I'm, oh, sure, I'm sure he's yeah. a big, intimidating bully. I'm sure. Yeah. But what you're saying is exactly right. Like, that is exactly how I should handle this. I knew you. I knew you would have something. I listen to every Ask Nick. I knew that you would have the right thing to say. I told my husband, I was like, I'm going to go on and I'm going to ask Nick because he's going to know. He's going to have like an outside perspective. My mom is super helpful, but like she has feelings about it because someone's telling her daughter they need a spanking and she's like, (laughs) well, what the heck, you know? And so she gets emotional. And while I appreciate her like support and like effort to like, you know, show support to us at the same time, my dad too, but like, they're just emotionally invested in the situation and it's hard to get like a unbiased perspective, I guess, especially when it comes to family situation. I hear you. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, the reality is, and it doesn't make it any less weird, but like your father-in-law has known you since you were 16 and you are dating or you're married to his son. And he, you know, I think parents, I've never been a father, so I don't know yet, but I can only assume parents just will always kind of see their children as children. And so, Mm-hmm. Not to defend the guy, because he should know it's inappropriate, but I don't think he was trying to be, like, creepy. I just think he sees you as a, a, a child. You know, I think he sees all his kids and subsequently their spouses as children, and he has created this world in which he's God. I mean, he lives on, you know, on, a, on this farm, super old school, very traditional. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. you know, you're just kind of dealing with this kind of stubborn, traditional, old school, conservative guy. but. You know, listen, like at the end of the day, they're either going to respect your boundaries or they're not. And you have the right not mm-hmm. to be made to feel disrespected, even in their house. Mm-hmm. We're running this business. I am so sorry that it's disappointing to you, but like, you know, be our cheerleader and maybe in the future. But like right now, all you're doing is pushing us away. But that's really mm-hmm. more of a conversation for your, your husband and his dad. It's not your job to fight your husband's battles. Try not to keep that angst. Not to sound. The only person I can control is me. Yeah, count your blessings so. because, like, you could be one of your husband's siblings who doesn't have that financial independence, doesn't have this thriving business. I'm sure that isn't helping our relationships at all, like, with them either. You're right in the sense that, like, compartmentalizing it, like, that there's a lot of factors going into probably why the relationships with his siblings, the adult ones especially, aren't 
like as good as they were before we started this business. I mean, I, it's probably more than just his dad that's causing the problem. Almost certainly the family drama is just beginning. Oh, joy. <laughs> but it's it's really up to you. Either you're going to make it into a war or you're just going to accept that father-in-law is this kind of, he is who he is. You're not going to change him. Yeah. But I would just for you be thankful that you married a man who can stand up to their parents because I think that's important for every adult. You know, there comes yeah. a time where, you know, as great as mom and dad might be, if mom and dad don't understand boundaries, you have to respectfully say, mom and dad, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's like a rite of passage. So, all right. I need to be less petty. Yeah, I, I'll definitely keep you posted. You know, my husband told me that if I mean, he's working today, but he was like, he told me that he would, he would have come on if I had made him do it. Like if I had told him it was really important to me, he's like, if it would be supportive to you, he's like, I would come on with you. And I was like, really? So maybe if we have a good update, I'll get him. To well, come on we'd love me. to chat with him. But most importantly, it sounds like, again, you really have a good one. He wants to support you. But I, I really think this is a you problem because your husband seems to have a good grasp on it. And again, he might have to have some conversations with his dad. And, and it sounds like they're in the middle of figuring out what their new relationship is going to be. Dad's struggling with this kind of identity. And but it, it, it's from your from what you're telling me, it sounds like your husband has a good grasp on it. He's not letting it dictate his feelings. And and, you know, I'm sure he has some things to work through, but you are mm -hmm. letting it like eat at you and it's bothering you. And it's like it's 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 eating away and taking it it's it's playing a role in other aspects of your life and you are carrying that energy into conversations with your mom and your friend and your uh, uh, you know and then you're showing up defensive and that those are things mm -hmm. that I think you can work on because old old dog so to speak you know I don't I don't know how many new tricks he's going to learn yeah all right yeah okay keep us posted yeah that's good advice all I right. will take care thank you so much all right bye bye yeah bye Take a bite out of summer with HelloFresh. That's right. From chef-crafted seasonal recipes to their new fresh and fit summer menu, HelloFresh brings flavors right to your door. I know so many of you all listening to this podcast are hardworking, busy professionals that's, you know, whether you love it or you hate it, just don't have time to be in the kitchen or you don't have time to grocery shop. I mean, my hardworking staff, they just simply just don't, do not have time to go grocery shop make dinner, and then clean. Oh my God. But HelloFresh makes it so much easier. They have such a variety of great, delicious meals that are healthy for you, easy to make, and easy to clean. They just bought every plate. So all the amazing uh, meals from every plate. Make your home the hangout place of summer with crowd-pleasing eats. HelloFresh Market makes summer entertaining a cinch. It's peak time for summer produce, and HelloFresh makes sure you get all the best picks all season long. Their ingredients travel from the farm to your door in less than seven days for quality that you can taste. Affordable, fast, easy to do. Stop eating out. Stop going to those fast food joints. There is something to be said about just, you know, while not wasting all that time going to the grocery store and like prepping and all those things. But in, in 20 minutes kind of making your own meal is it's satisfying and gratifying. It tastes delicious. It's easy to clean. If you haven't tried HelloFresh, start now. So to get your HelloFresh on, go to HelloFresh.com slash V-I-A-L-L-50. That's V-I-A-L-L-5-0 and use code V-I-A-L-L-5-0 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's right. Go to HelloFresh.com slash V-I-A-L-L-5-0 with code V-I-A-L-L-5-0 for 50% off plus free shipping. America's number one meal kit. Drizzly is the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep right when you want it. Regardless of the situation, Drizzly is making your life easier. Whether you're throwing a party or you just want to, you're feeling a little lazy after a hard day of work and you want to crack open a nice bottle of wine and share it with your friend or your partner, Drizzly makes it so convenient and easy. Also, they have such a great variety of beer, wine, and spirits. If you are a, maybe a, a beer junkie, you like trying different microbreweries or different IPAs, such a great variety. It's fun. It's easy. It's convenient. If you're throwing a party, you run out of your spirits or your beer, just go to the Drizzly app. Order a bunch more. It'll be at your doorstep in less than 60 minutes. The party goes on. If you can't make it to a party, you can still send a nice little you know, treat. Hey, sorry, I couldn't be there. 
Honestly, the parties that you don't want to go to, you still look like a hero. Oh, I couldn't make it, but I watch you buy as a bottle of wine. Anyways, Drizzly makes it so much easier. Drizzly is the go-to app for drink delivery. It's, again, the number one most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep when you want it. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Drizzly.com. Again, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. Drizzly.com. How's it going? Hey, Nick. I'm Gabby. I'm 31. Uh, how can we help, Gabby? My boyfriend broke up with me a second time, quoting again that he's not ready. Okay. So give us a little backstory about your, your relationship. What do you mean he broke up with you a second time? So what was it, about four or five years ago, we were both on dating apps. We, we met via an app. Um, we had a lot in common, good connection, same age-ish. And he was just a bit older than me. Uh, lived close to each other from the same community, same background, um, work in the same industry. Uh, we met, went on four dates. Um, and then he texted me saying, oh, not ready for a relationship and don't want to miss you around. I was disappointed at the time, but, you know, absolutely fine. It's only been four dates. So basically for four years, we were watching each other's Instagram stories, um, reacting every now and then, but had no no communication other than that. And then I was on holiday in the town, basically, that our families are both from. Yeah, he slid into the, into the DMs while I was on holiday and just said, oh, you know, like, I'm great. I had an amazing holiday. Um, we were chatting while I was over there. He said, oh, when you're back, uh, we should we should meet up. So we did. He was very much like trying to woo me at the beginning. I, I, bet I went to, I went on the first, the first, the first, second first date with him with a list of things that I wanted to just like get out and be like, right, so why am I here? What's going on? Why do you want to know me all of a sudden after four years? And basically couldn't say it to his face on the first date because he was so nervous. We met up again and again. We eventually had the discussions um, and then, yeah, and then he hits me up one day out of the blue with, I know I said I'm ready, but I'm actually not. And yeah, we need to, I need some time alone. After dating for 10 or 11 months. Yeah. Yeah. We was official. We've met each other's friends, families. And how, for the 10 or 11 months that you were boyfriend and girlfriend, like how, how was it? Like, were you happy? Yeah, it was great. It was great. Like the only the only thing is his communication over when we weren't together wasn't amazing. What do you mean? As in he's not great with his phone. Okay. But I I, I don't think that was um, a specific issue with me. I think that was that's just him with his phone because when I met his friends, they they all said like, three of them straight away said, "Oh, how do you cope with him in his phone?" And this last most recent, you know, how did he communicate that? Did he text you again? Yeah, text. So he said that he had COVID, so I couldn't see him. Um, and then text me that while he supposedly had COVID. You don't believe him? No. Well, first of all, like it's one thing to go on a date, a handful of dates with someone and text them, hey, listen, I don't want to waste mm-hmm. your time. I just don't think I'm ready for a relationship. That that's, seems appropriate and fair and reasonable given the context of that relationship. It's quite another to date someone for months build rapport, meet each other's families, become a part of each other's lives, you know, and, and break up with a more text. That's just a dick move on his part. It's yeah. inconsiderate. It leaves you clearly probably having a lot of questions. It leaves you confused. It's a, a very selfish way yeah. of communicating. So any claim on his part of doing this for you or thinking about you you can throw it in his face that he clearly has not because if he cared about your feelings he would give you the courtesy of sitting down with you and having a conversation and talk through this. A few days later, we did actually sit down and have a discussion. Oh, you did? Okay. And how, how did that get initiated? Um, I basically messaged him and said, after this amount of time, we developed to actually sit down and hash this out. All right, good for you. And, and I, I was very surprised. Why were you so surprised? I don't know. I guess he's just, I mean, 32, but he acts like he's a child. Um, Okay, so he acts like he's a child. So him being childish in his communication is a is a is a thing of his. I think so. Yeah, I just think he's not used to thinking about anyone else but himself. He's I mean he's a guy who lives alone. He has done for a, a long time. Um, he's not he's never had to put anyone else's needs equal to or before his own. Okay, well that matters. That's not a you problem. That's a him problem. 
But yeah, I, I agree. Um, and he also said that he needed time alone to kind of work on himself and that he needed to fix the last piece of the puzzle that was in his head. What does that mean? Exactly. What does that mean? Did you ask him that? Yeah. What do you and say? His response was just, I'm not ready. What, what is he asking of you, though? Is he asking you to wait around? Is he asking you not to wait around? When we left it, I said, so what, what is this? Is it, what are we doing? Is this a break up? What's, what's happening? And he said that um, he wants to spend some time apart and catch up every two to three weeks. Then um, in, after the summer, reassess where we're at. Did you agree to this? Stupidly, yes. Um, and I really wish I didn't. Well, you can always change your mind. Yeah. Next time you uh, have your little check-in. We, see, we haven't. We haven't had a check-in whatsoever. Okay. Um, nothing. It's gone back to just watching each other's Instagram stories. Um, Stop watching his Instagram stories. Yeah. Block them. I know. I probably should. But... Out of, basically, out of all the guys that I have dated in the past, he's the only one that I haven't been able to block and delete. Yeah, but there's not some special, like, magic potion that he has, and it's not destiny and fate. It is just you deciding to fuck with yourself and create some sort of narrative in your head of why you are interested. You know, he's just dangling a carrot. He's kind of like telling you, well, he never really says, I don't like you or I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm not ready. So he gives you something to chase and he gives you something to, to wonder. And, and, you know, I'm sure at some point your ego is triggered and wondering why you're not good enough for him to be ready and yada, yada, yada. And so these are all why you can't get over it. You know what I'm saying? It's not some sort of magic thing he has over you. It's not, and it's not the love or the bond that you two have. And I'm sure that's a nice little relationship, but you're, it, by your own words, you've told me that this type of behavior is A, not surprising, and B, you've described him as immature, selfish, and incapable of, on a re- and capable of counting on him to think of others before himself on any type of regular basis. You, you've described him as someone you can't count on. So immature, selfish, and unreliable are characteristics of this guy. See that yeah, when you say it like that. Yeah. No, you, you said but it like you, you said it like that. I'm just yeah, repeating back your words. Yeah. He's genuinely a lovely, lovely guy. And like I have no I doubt. Really have a good have, time together. No, I'm sure he is. But, yeah. I'm sure he's a total fun hang. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he's yeah. lovely. I'm sure he's fun. I'm sure he has a list of great characteristics. Nevertheless, you have described him as self centered, immature and unreliable. And when it comes to a 31-year-old wanting to have a committed relationship, I'm assuming maturity, selflessness, and reliability are characteristics you would want in a partner. So me being uh, me and like overthinking everything, I'm trying to think of like what's going on in his head. Yeah, I don't know. That's not, not your job. It's not your problem. And he's not even thinking about what's going on in his head because it's not like He's not like, hey, babe, I need to work on myself. By the way, I scheduled some time with a therapist. Like, what is he doing to work on himself? Probably nothing. See, that's the thing. He's very proud and he won't. I, don't, I think he'll just try and work it out himself. Does um, that, that, what does that even mean? Yeah. yeah. Right now, he just is, he has cold feet. He's a couple years older than you, right? So he's in his mid to early 30s. And yeah. he's just wondering, is this yeah. it? Is this it for me? Or is there something better? That's what he's thinking. I mean, quite honestly, whether he wants to even admit to that to himself. And I'm sure if you said to him, hey, you're just like, you're keeping me on hold so you can see if you can find something better. He would be offended by that. I'm sure he'd be like, oh, God, that is not it. How could you say that to me? But like, whatever. That's what he's doing. I think you need to block him on Instagram, at least on Instagram, because like this whole looking at each other's story routine that you guys have is it's silly and it's immature, but it also like keeps you guys close enough and, and it keeps him, it keep, allows him to keep tabs on you mm-hmm. and vice versa, but it keeps you emotionally invested. You need to like disengage and he needs to feel like you're not there right now. He just feels he's very confident in you're you waiting around. He is just not worried. Yeah. Which I'm not doing. He's not. <laughs> I'm not waiting around. He feels like he has control and he has the power in this relationship. He feels like he's calling the shots. And, th- and this can change quickly. At any moment, you might react in a certain way 
you know, maybe it's blocking them on Instagram, or maybe you start going, or, or just, or just like, you know, fucking energy in the world. Like he, you know, I, I kind of believe in that shit, you know? And so like, maybe you just start moving on. He'll fucking feel it. He'll feel when he has less power. And that, again, that could flip in a day where all of a sudden you get the thought of like, I don't, you start seeing him for how he's acting and you start seeing him as this immature, self-centered and unreliable person. It kind of gives you the ick. And at the moment he feels that like feeling of ick that you have for him, he'll feel that at some, on some level and it'll get to him because right now he feels like he has all the power. And he feels like no matter what he does, even if he pisses you off, eventually you're going to come around, that he's calling the shots. And this might be just a subconscious feeling that he has. I don't think he's out there saying, I don't think he's like telling his buddies, she'll, she'll, you know, she'll just wait around for me. He, he might even be saying to his friends, oh, she doesn't deserve this. I don't want, you know, she's the greatest. He's probably saying all the right things, but inside, he's not afraid to lose you. Yeah. He's just not. That could easily change. That is entirely up to you and how you handle it. And so you got to change your behavior yeah. for him to chase his. Yeah. And one last thing. Um, and then I think we've got like the whole, the whole story out there. So basically, I've, I have never been an uncle. And he knows that. And then it got to the point where, you know, we were going to. And he was having issues. So you haven't had sex yet? Mm -mm, no. Okay. You were going to have sex. He couldn't hold an erection. And he knew that it, this would be your first time having sex is another yeah. component. Of and it. it was kind of making me wish that I never talked to him about my situation. Yeah, it might, it might be something that's messaging with him. So you're a virgin. Yeah. Okay. And you Not for any particular reason. Sure. Yeah, whatever. What conversations have you guys had around your virginity? That it is, that, that I am. And... Um, that is not for any particular reason and that I don't want him to feel any pressure, but I think he took on some pressure. Okay. Um, Sounds like you handled it the right way. Yeah. No, I, I wanted to be upright and honest. But more importantly, it's just like you didn't make it some sort of big, like, rite of passage. No, know? no, 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 not at all. I, I said to him, like, don't treat me any differently. Um, yeah. And, and you're in terms of outside of sex, but you've had a intimate relationship. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like literally everything else apart from the actual one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if your virginity is part is playing a role in this, again, that speaks to his immaturity. You didn't make it some big thing. You didn't say thing that would psych him out. You're like, hey, listen, I just it hasn't happened yet. I want to have sex with you. It's not even like I want you to be the first. I just want to have sex with you. And does that mean that we have to get married? No, it just means no. like I want to have sex with you. You know, you're literally you're not doing anything that would cause him to make it more of a bigger than it needs to be. And if he is making it a bigger deal than it needs to be, that's a him problem. And, you know, that's his journey. You need to do yourself a favor and stop trying to figure him out. Yeah. But that's kind of put me off telling anyone else that in the future, though. Just because, I, I don't know, I think they're looking Okay, well, sure. Especially with being, being the age that I am. So let's work. Do you, do you need to tell someone? I feel like these are, there, yeah. there's mixed opinions on this. But I feel like it's not like any of their business. I, I've, I've heard the arguments as like, well, I feel like I should tell them because at first it could be difficult and things like that. But like you could have been someone who's abstained from sex for a handful of years, had already, you know, maybe you had sex with a boyfriend ever. And if you abstain from sex for a period of time, the first time you have sex in a while, there might be some like challenges. You might need a more of a warm up period. You know, you get what I'm getting at. If you don't want to tell someone at this point, I don't think you need to. I don't think you owe it to anyone is all I'm saying. And you can tell them after the fact if you want to. It's your sex life. It's yeah. your story, you know, because you're right. There is no real reason. And you feel like you have to explain yourself. You have to yada yada this or you know you are a sexually active woman you are messing around with your partner you're doing stuff it's not like you you don't know your way around the kitchen so to speak you just haven't had sex yet it's whatever who, who who cares but unfortunately yeah. some men it's might you know make it a thing and get in their own head and and you know and freak out and 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 be immature about it so yeah if nothing else maybe in the future you don't tell them fine yeah this is more about his immaturity 
and his selfishness and his lack of reliability and communication. You ha- he tried to break up with you over text after dating you for 11 months. You had to ask for the courtesy of a face-to-face conversation. And that should make you mad and frustrated and upset. But right now, you're not getting frustrated or upset. You are too busy empathizing with him and trying to wonder what's wrong with him and figure him out and understand him. And, and that's stopping you from getting angry. And I think maybe you need to get a little angry at him. So, literally before this call, I was considering reaching out and just checking in to see nah, what's going on. I think you should block him. Why not? Block him on Instagram, at least. He needs to stop. He needs to see something. Why can't he see your stories? That'll maybe get him to reach out. And maybe it won't. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's a little gamey, I guess. But, like, the, it's just the fact that you say, oh, like, it's like this has become a thing. Your form of communication is to watch each other's stories. And that in itself isn't enough to keep some, allow someone to keep tabs on you, make them feel like they have access to you. So take that access away from him and see if it like alters how he communicates with you. Yeah. And for someone who's uh, incredibly bad at using his phone to communicate, he is always the first person to watch the stories. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like he doesn't want to. And so if he reaches out to you and you say, oh, did you block me? And, and, and you just don't get defensive and be like, I'm just kind of tired of, of us only communicating through watching our stories. And quite frankly, I just don't, I'm, I'm moving on. You just say that, I'm moving on. And if he says, oh, I thought we were keep, keeping tabs, forget about the whole, well, you haven't reached out shit. Just, I, you, need, you need to change your tune. You need to sound like someone that without his permission or without checking in with him, that you decided for yourself what was best for you. And what is best for you is not, you know, you're not, you don't take breaks. You're, you're either in a relationship or you're not. You're either going to have a partner who wants to work through things and work through their issues and work through their insecurities and their fears and their challenges as a couple by saying, hey, babe, this, I'm, I'm struggling right now. Can I communicate something with you? I'm feeling a little disconnected. I'm feeling a little worried. I'm feeling a little scared. I'm feeling a little anxious or whatever it is. He could, he could have done all that. He chose not to. That's fine. And you're just going to say, hey, listen, I just, I want to be with someone who wants to work through their individual challenges and the challenges of, as a couple together. And I want to work with someone who, if they feel like, I want to be with someone, if they feel like they have to work on themselves, they actually do something about it. Who's open to things like therapy. And if you want to be single, go be single. But I am no longer just here to wait for you to figure your shit out. Quite frankly, I've like, it's been five years almost. Yeah. If you want to be in a relationship with me, then that's a different conversation, but I'm not doing this like in between checking in thing. I'm not putting myself on hold for anyone. And then what do I do when he inevitably does reach back out? Because well, he will. Yeah. But like, then you have to ask yourself, do you really believe in this guy? And you would, I wouldn't do it without any upfront expectations or boundaries. What has changed? How, what assurances does he give you that make you think that he's not going to do this again 11 months from now, 15 months from now, or three months from now? Is he willing to get couples therapy? Is he willing to get individual therapy? This is the second time in three years you have just randomly broke up with me because you were scared. Well, what are you going to do about it? I need to be with someone that when they feel these feelings that you're feeling now doesn't just jump ship. And I have no reason to think that you're not going to do that. So unless you do something that makes me think that like this is going to change in the future. I can't trust being with you. So that's up to you. Like, do you have the guts to say that to him? Do you have the guts to enforce that boundary? Because it would be a huge risk for you to take him back with no evidence that anything has changed other than he's just like got something out of his system. Oh no, it would be incredibly difficult to trust him again. Yeah. So if he's like, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm really sorry I treated you this way. You didn't deserve this. I'm really reflecting. I've read some books. I'm starting therapy. I'm really committed to like growing up and, and this is the work I'm willing to do and this is what I want to do with you. Then maybe that's something you're open to having a conversation with about him. But unless he actually yeah. shows you what he's doing to change, then I, I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, I'm being, I think I'm being a bit of a mug with him, to be honest. It's just on paper, it just seems perfect. You know, it's that thing that where. No, we he just doesn't. complement each other so well. On paper, he does not seem perfect. On paper, he seems selfish, yeah. unreliable, and immature. Initially, initially. And then, you know, you get to know them. Well, no, 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 no. And then no. the selfish, unreliable, and immature yeah. comes out. He is great when things are going great, when he's getting his way, when he is happy. But that's not life. 
life has its ups and downs. Life has its stresses. Life has its moments of complacency and boredom and frustration, even at our partners. And we have to work through it. We don't get to just jump ship or take breaks or take timeouts. And that's who he is. That is part of who he is. He might be all those other great things too. But like when you say on paper, you need to list those things out too. You know, we, we, we say, oh, they're so great on paper. And you just conveniently only list out the things you like about them and just disregard the things that you don't like about them. That's not on paper. On paper is all of it. And on paper, he's okay. <laughs> That's what he is on paper. He's, he's okay. He's fine. He is someone who's been fun to date for 10 months, but you can't count on. That's who he is on paper. Someone at any moment might just text you and say, I need a break. That, that's who he is on paper. Yeah, you're right. All right, so let's go yeah. ahead and block him on Instagram. I'm going to block him. Everyone right. has told me to block him. Right, I'm yeah. going to block him. <laughs> Especially on Instagram. And stop. Yeah. When you have this thought of wondering why about him, you got to stop. Yeah. You got to change your thought process. Mm -hmm. All this energy that you are using thinking about him is energy you're taking away from yourself and whatever it is you're investing in. Your thoughts of trying to understand him have no impact on him whatsoever. It doesn't help the two of you. It doesn't help him. And it doesn't help you. It's just something to do. Yeah. I should not be occupying my headspace right now. Yeah. I bet. Listen, yeah. all easier said than done. I've been there. I'm a, prof yeah. I'm a professional ruminator. So as someone who, who can think about anything obsessively, I promise you, you can control your thoughts and you can change them. You just have to hold yourself accountable. I'll do that. Thank you. All right. Keep us posted. Uh, I will do. All right. I will do. I'll update you up after the summer. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Good luck. Thanks. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. True story. I, I've been gone for three weeks. Can't tell you exactly what yet. Uh, part of it was at the lake house, spending eight days at the lake house. And while it was comfortable, it was nice that my parents have yet to get a Helix mattress. So it was fine. We slept fine. Before that, it was... A nightmarish. But last night was the first night sleeping in my bed in three weeks. You look like a kid on Christmas. And it was, I'm, I'm in, I'm emotional thinking about it. It's, it's so comfortable. I slept like a baby. I woke up in the middle of the night just to appreciate how comfortable I was. It was like, this is so good. I'm so comfortable right now. I'm going to outfit the entire lake house with only Helix mattresses. You too can be sleeping on heaven. You're not far away. You just have to go to helixsleep.com. You take a quick assessment. And their prices are so incredibly affordable. You don't need a box spring. They ship it in this like box, comes in this like airtight wrap. You open it up, it blows up in this beautiful mattress. It is game changing. They have a mattress for everyone. They, Helix Sleep offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award winning Lux Collection. Whether you're big, tall, sleep hot, sleep cold, it doesn't matter. Helix Sleep has a mattress for you. They also have a 100 night trial. You can sleep on it for 100 nights and test it out. You can jump on it, sleep on it. Also, all their mattresses come with a 10 to 15 year warranty, depending on the mattress. You don't need a hundred days, nights. You're going to love it. You don't need a 15 year warranty. It, it, I don't know. I've had my Helix Seat mattress for three years now. Last night, sleeping on it, it felt like truly heaven. I don't, I don't know. If, if you, you need to have a Helix mattress. If I had a genie, you know, with one wish, I would wish for you all to have a Helix mattress. That's what I'd wish for you. Unfortunately, genies aren't real. So you just have to go and buy it. Just go to helixsleep.com. You take a quick assessment. Super easy. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. You get two free pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash V-I-A-L-L. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Again, helixsleep.com slash V-I-A-L-L for 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Helix, better sleep starts now. Babel with Babel. You only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson so you can start having real-life conversations in as little as three weeks. It's summer. You're probably traveling. If you're going to Europe or Asia or Mexico or Latin America or wherever they don't speak English, you got to get Babbel, even if it's to learn a couple key phrases to drastically enhance your travel experience. If you're going into a country where they don't speak English, your experience will be so much more enjoyable if you just walk in and say hello it, like bonjour or how do you ask for like you know restaurant recommendations or check into your hotel or you know when you shop it's so much more enjoyable to immerse yourself into the culture and the country that you're visiting and Babbel helps you get there also you can be speaking and having real life conversations if you're committed to having just 10 minute lessons every day in as little as three weeks you can be talking having a conversation in a different language so why not just do it. 14 different languages that you can choose from. English, Spanish, French, German, and, and so much more. 
Uh, they also have live class classes with real life instructors. They don't use AI like most uh, other language uh, apps out there. It was created by over 150 language experts and voiced by real native speakers, not computers. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash V-I-A-L-L. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash V-I-A-L-L for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Need a break from reality? Reality got you down? Well, cheer up, buttercup, because Paramount Plus has your great reality escape. Escape into new seasons of the biggest competition shows out there like Survivor, Big Brother, and the Challenge World Championship with the boldest personalities from The Family Stallone, Rule Paul's Drag Race All-Stars, and Queen of the Universe, and the wildest drama like Are You the One? Plus hundreds of previous seasons all streaming at your fingertips. See? Reality ain't so bad. Embrace reality. Paramount Plus, stream now. How's it going? Hi, I'm Danielle. I'm 25, and uh, my long-distance boyfriend says he's losing his feelings for me. Okay, that sucks. I'm sorry. How, <laughs> how long have you been together? It's going to be one year at the end of June. Mm-hmm. So in a few weeks, it'll be a year. Happy anniversary. Uh, <laughs> so how, when, did he, Thank you. when did he say this? And how did he say it? Like, what, like, was this like a soft breakup kind of thing? No, um, because he said it's it's normal. He said that he's been away for a long time. This was about two weeks ago. We were on a phone call and I told him I was struggling with long distance. And he said he was struggling too. But, you know, his family dog had probably lost some feelings for him as well. And that that's normal because he's been away for so long. Um, he said it had nothing to do with me, that he still loves me, but it's just normal to lose feelings. Okay, so he's just being very literal. He's a very literal, logical person. I'm definitely like the dreamer and the hopeless romantic in the situation. Yeah, he's just more like, well, I haven't seen you, so I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I am his first girlfriend. How old are you again? 25. How old is he? 26. Okay. And what's he do? What's, why is he long distance? He um, is actually a sponsored snowboarder. So when all the snow melts in the Midwest, he has to Oregon and Washington to continue snowboarding and getting videos and clips in the summer. What do you want help with? Like, what's your goal? Like what you should do about this or? Yeah, I guess I don't know if that should be a deal breaker. And it's logical for me to say a boyfriend should not lose feelings for somebody, especially when I've given him my support, you know, for the past two, three months he's been away. Or if, that's natural. Well, both, I guess. So in terms of like the fe- like what he said, like the feelings department, like, yeah, I mean, logically he makes sense, right? You know, he's been gone. Mm-hmm. He hasn't seen you. He's out there making content and snowboarding. You're away. You're literally living two separate lives. And so basically he's saying, I feel less connected to you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I guess where I'm struggling is I can I can tell that he's losing feelings just because he isn't being as communicative and our conversations kind of suck now. So, you know, I understand that he's losing feelings. I kind of get it. Our dynamic has shifted. But I think that lack of communication is where I'm stuck. Well, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is it just kind of comes down to this is the relationship that I guess well, both of you on some sense have kind of carved out for yourself. And certainly, you know, he has. And then big question is like, are you okay with it? You know, like I think people often make this mistake, right? Someone in the relationship sets an expectation or enforces a boundary, whatever that is, right? The expectation is, hey, your boyfriend in this case is, by the way, I'm a sponsored snowboarder. I travel. I don't know if he invited you to come on his journey or whatever, or you just got, or just wasn't an option. You knew about it, but he set this expectation. You agreed to it. And then maybe there's a boundary in there. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, babe, I can't be bothered all day long with text messaging. I, I have too much shit to do. I don't, I don't know. The point is, is that you have a choice to refuse the expectation or the boundary. You can just be like, well, that doesn't work for me. And in a relationship, often when someone communicates an expectation or enforces a boundary, uh, if the kind of the power dynamic is a little off where he might feel more confident in the relationship or whatever. And, that, and I don't, you know, that can change drastically as we often talk about. But someone in your shoes might be reluctant to ruffle any feathers or say, hey, that doesn't work for me because, well, it's like, I don't want to lose them. So you are forced with accepting less than you would otherwise would. 
And so you're just going to have to decide for yourself, is this relationship and its current form, does it serve you? That's what makes it hard because I have visited him out in Oregon and I have tried my best to be supportive of his dreams. And so the fact that he's losing feelings for me, it's like, there's nothing else I can do for you. I'm just being me and supporting you the best I can. So if you're losing feelings, that doesn't seem like a me problem. Correct. And he's not willing, he's not sounding like he's doing anything about it, you know, and he's only 26 and clearly in a very kind of selfish stage of his life and, and no judgment, honestly, like he's going to be a sponsored snowboarder. Now's the time to do it. You know, he might be living out a personal dream of his and it just not, might not be in the cards. A selfish thing might be for him to try to maintain a relationship he doesn't have time for. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It definitely feels like he's saying, this is my life and you can fit or you can leave. Correct. Yeah. And I wish he was a little bit more flexible than that. Yeah. And he, he does the thing that's kind of confusing and frustrating where he doesn't say it like that because that would come across as fairly harsh and you might even call him an asshole for being as direct is that, but that is what is going on. And you know, he does his things look, well, I still love you. And you're like thinking, oh, well, he loves me. How can I break up with a guy who says he loves me? You know, everything he's saying is making sense. So, and he's putting the onus yeah. on you, but it might feel unfair, but he is currently happy with this setup. Yes, you're correct. Here's the thing though, Nick, is that he came home a few days ago. Uh-huh. And? So... Uh... You know, I brought up, hey, you're losing. You said you were losing feelings for me. We haven't talked about that. And he said, I stand by what I said. Did they come back after seeing you? I didn't want to rock the boat because he had just came back and I wanted to celebrate that. But um, it really hurt. Yeah. Hearing that. And so I just brushed over it because I didn't want to make a scene or start a fight his first day back together. But now he's back for the summer. So I don't know how to handle it. I think you need to stop being afraid to lose him. You're right. But that's hard when you love someone. Well, what do you, you, what do you love about him? Oh, I've never been asked that question before. You probably haven't <laughs> thought of it either. No, probably not. <laughs> let, me, let me grab a journal. Let me yeah. grab a journal from the past year and I'll tell you. But seriously, that might be something you want to think about. If you've listened to this show, you've heard me yeah. ask other people, how do they make, what do you love about how they make you feel? And it sounds like he makes you feel frustrated and confused, unloved, unappreciated. Yeah. And you know, you bring up a good point because during our phone conversation, when he was in Oregon, he said, you know what, Danielle, I feel upset because I am putting in effort for you. When I'm not snowboarding, I'm thinking about you. I am texting you. I try to call you every night. So he was frustrated that I was mad at him for not feeling connected. Okay. Well, I mean, he said that he was putting in the effort. Maybe he was, you know, maybe you're just not on the same page of how much effort he, you need versus how much he's willing to give. And that doesn't make you needy. It just maybe means that you two like aren't compatible, but like he, he's, he's telling you this from the perspective of a 26 year old guy who's in a kind of a selfish stage of his life and someone who he is doubling down on the fact that he's lost feelings for you. So it's just like, yeah, I mean, for me to try to make someone feel loved for someone who I'm not feeling love for them, it, it, I, w- I would imagine just even texting him once a day, be like, hey, how's it going? Like, feels like a lot of effort, you know? That's the point. Damn, that's, that's the hard truth. You're right. You know, he doesn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so now I'm just stuck trying to decide whether that's something I can put up with or that's something why, why would I think you, I deserve more. Exactly. Why would you want to put up with it? Why are you going to waste energy trying to figure out if you're capable of accepting less than what you know you want and deserve in a relationship. Is there a medal? Why Why <laughs> are you trying to figure out if you could put up with that? For what? Just to say that you have a, a snowboarding boyfriend? Yeah, I think it's an ego thing. Probably, I think probably yeah. part of it <laughs> is ego. There you go. That he loved me at some point. We had a great relationship before he moved to Oregon. So that's what confuses me. And that's what I feel like I'm trying to force back. Yeah, I mean, listen, Things change. People change. You know, situations change. Your situation changed. You fell in love when life was simpler for him. And then he got this cool and fun opportunity and you kind of got in the way. Yeah. And I think our lives were so different because he was in Oregon having fun 
and meeting tons of new people and living out his dreams. And I'm living in a city in the Midwest, going to work every day, waking up, making breakfast, going home from work, taking a shower, going to bed. What do you do for work? I work at a bike shop. You could probably work at a bike shop in Oregon. <clears throat> Oregon. 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 <laughs> Oregon. Yeah. I'm just saying, imagine a world where your, your boyfriend said, hey, babe, this is like a kind of a selfish ask of me, but I got this crazy opportunity. I got to go to Oregon, but I'm obsessed with you. I love you. I don't want to be without you. Would you move with me for a summer? I don't know what you would do, but I bet I you- I wouldn't. You wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. Okay. Why? Because aside from that relationship, I wouldn't see any other op like opportunity for me. And I don't want to move across the country for- a man who I've only been dating for a year. Okay. Relationship wise, what, what are your, what are your personal relationship goals for yourself? My personal, really, my personal relationship goals is to grow with someone, to have somebody accept me while I'm growing. Okay. Do you want to get married? Do you want to just like have a life partner? Do you not know? Do you want to have kids someday? Like what are your long-term relationship goals? My long-term relationship goals is just to find someone I have fun with. Family is not really something I'm thinking about. Marriage okay. is not something I'm thinking about. I'm thinking of a life partner. Okay. Maybe neither of you are just really in a position to be in a relationship. Or be in a serious, committed, like Correct. Yeah. traditional relationship. Well, not even like, I don't, traditional, whatever. I'm just saying like, relationships take work. They do. And they're so hard. Even the best ones take work and, and they take sacrifice. And it takes energy to stay connected with someone. It takes sacrifice and it takes that much more energy when it is long distance, right? And neither of you are wrong for wanting to prioritize yourself. You know, your boyfriend right now is just like, hey, I got this very cool. I mean, it sounds really cool. A fucking sponsored snowboarder. What a neat thing, you know? But as a 26 year old guy who's got no kids and no real responsibilities, what a fucking dream, right? You are just like, hey, I got some shit I want to do too. I got this job I like. I got my friends. I got my community. Like, I, I want to I wanna think of me too. Also, totally reasonable and valid for you to do, right? But I'm just saying two people, even if it's just life partners, it, it, it requires sacrifice. It requires commitment. You know, it's not yeah. wrong for you to want to like not move to Oregon, you know, for the summer, but like, that's no different than him not wanting not to go. You two might just be at a point in your life where you're not willing to sacrifice a certain level of independence for anyone else, even people you claim to love. And that's also totally okay. At 2023, 20, people are settling down far later in life, right? It's not like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you go to college or high school, you date someone. And then whoever you're in love with in your early 20s, you're like, hey, let's get married and let's have kids. Right? That's, just not, that's happening far more, uh, far less nowadays. All, totally fine. But people want to have this companionship and they want to have someone around. And so like, they just kind of want to have someone for the sake of having someone because, well, it's better than feeling lonely or dating around and things like that and the inconsistency of not having someone. Those relationships, even if you like don't, they still require work because- you know, you want to feel like a priority to the people you claim they're a priority. And right now you're, you're not feeling like a priority and that makes, and you're, it's totally valid for you to feel. My read on what you're telling me is you're just, you're, you neither of you are in a place to really give what this relationship needs to work. And that's, that's okay. No one's the bad guy, but staying in this relationship and being frustrated at one another for not, you know, being committed to this relationship where mm -hmm. neither of you are willing to make some sacrifices. And sacrifices might like, they're not always going to feel equal day to day. And what I mean by that is, if you, if, you know, um, we're deep dealing in hypotheticals because none of this happened. But if your boyfriend is say, hey, babe, I just like, oh, I want to make this work. I love you and I want to stay connected with you. And I have this like really crazy experience and it's a selfish ass, but would you come with me? And you could say yes, right? And that would be a, you know, you would be prioritizing the relationship mm -hmm. over your own individual needs in that moment. And maybe it all worked out. Maybe you found a cool job. Who knows, right? But like, you would be doing that for the relationship. And he, you would be the one making a bigger sacrifice than him and that he gets to do what he wants to do. Well, in the future, 
that that needs to somehow be paid back organically, right? You know, mm-hmm. but like that can that might happen over time. You know, you might not be able to say, well, if I'm doing this feed right now, what are you gonna do for me immediately? I, you know, you have to work through those things. Neither of you seem all that interested in like kind of long term planning with each other either. You're just kind of more like, hey, let's just like not let's not rock the boat. Let's just see where it goes. I like you. Yeah. You like me. That's all I really need to know to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And that's fine. But it becomes more confusing. You know, it's like you're, you're, right. li- you're living day to day. It's just like, well, what do you mean? It's good for you right now. So what about next week? You might just break up with me. Exactly. And I think that's why when things get shaky or, or when something doesn't go right, then it feels like it's the end of the relationship. Sure. Because if the boat shakes, then it's like, OK, is this over? Yeah, it's, 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 there's not much commitment in this committed relationship. Wow. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. And that's why it's frustrating because I feel like I have been sacrificing for him because I agreed to be in a relationship and I have been supporting his dreams. And I went to visit him. You know, I bought a plane ticket. I took off work. I, yeah. you know, but that shouldn't went through even, all of that. That shouldn't be. The, and again, no one's wrong here. It doesn't <laughs> seem like, but that shouldn't be that big of a deal. You know, and even you, you're just like, I got a plane ticket. I took off all work. I had to visit this motherfucker. You know, like (laughs) that's not how it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that much work for you two to want to be connected and and visit each other and and being each other's lives. You're just like you're you guys seem like you're together because. You're you're you don't mind each other. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's how it is now. And that's just a hard pill to swallow. And in the beginning, I thought he was my end game. I, we both did. And maybe, maybe you are. Relationships take work and they require sacrifice. They do. They're, you know, even the best of ones. And they require two people sitting down and saying, what, why are we in this relationship? It requires a common goal. Even if that common goal is to always make each other feel prioritized and loved. And right now that is not a common goal. You guys have no common goal. Your common You're goal right. your common goal is I guess to you know, not fuck other people. Like what is yeah. what is your common goal? Like what are you guys working towards? Nothing. You're right. 100%. So you're just kind of like mm-hmm. in it to like have some, just to say you have a boyfriend or to say you have a girlfriend. Here's the thing though. You say relationships take effort and they take work and they take sacrifice. And so for these past two months, it has been a lot of work because our relationship changed from being in person to being long distance. So now I'm in this place after hearing what you had to say, should I continue trying to put in work or put in effort for this relationship? Well, I mean, uh, it doesn't. No, I don't know. It does. Uh, listen, that's for you guys to decide, right? It's not for me no, to decide. No, tell me. Um, my read, like, also, you keep a lot. Like, even the little, uh, littlest of things can feel like a lot of work for people who have a hard time prioritizing anyone but themselves and their needs. And you two are. It sounds like to me both kind of in this selfish stage of your life. And that is okay. If you're ever going to be selfish, your, your early to mid twenties are a good time to do it, especially when you don't have kids or anyone else to really, who really counts on you. But nevertheless, you, to be in this relationship, I think at a minimum, you guys should at least be willing to say, I want to make sacrifices for you in this relationship. And I don't even know if either of you feel like you're willing or capable of doing that. And sacrifices shouldn't be making phone calls every day. If, if, if sending a text to your girlfriend or flying out to see your boyfriend is like some sort of big ask, then I don't think you guys should really be together. Like you should want to reach out to each other. You should miss each other. And it's okay if you don't. But like maybe you guys just have a nice mutual respect for each other. And I don't really believe in breaks per se, but maybe you just say, hey, listen, right now, maybe... We should just end things because right now all we're doing is making like I respect you, you respect me, I care about you, you care about me. But I don't want to I don't want to hear from my boyfriend he's falling out of love with me. And and all he's really all he's trying to say is I have other things going on right now. I'm really committed to snowboarding. I want your support and but I don't want to feel guilty for how I feel or don't feel. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. I think we 
are mistaking respect for love. Yeah. And out of respect, maybe you guys say, hey, listen, I just think right now you have other things going on in your life. And I just think you're too busy to make me a priority. And I'm not mad at you because like it shouldn't feel like man, like hard manual labor to like reach out to me or want to hang out with me. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me feel bad. Constant. You were saying I'm feeling less connected to you. I'd rather just like call it off. And if we find our way back to each other, so be it. But like, maybe we find our way back to each other when we have, when we're, when we're both willing to make each other of a priority. Yeah. You just say, Hey, listen, like I, you know, why, why are we here? What is our common goal? Ask him, you know, ask him that. Sure. I mean, if he, if he was short of, if you want to just break up with him, break up with him. But if he pushes back, you just be like, listen, I care about you. I love you. I like, you know, if I were to be, I can't, I literally can't imagine being with anyone else, but maybe, maybe neither of us should, should be in a relationship right now. Maybe both of us are just too busy with our own shit that we can't give the other person what they need. Being an adult doesn't mean you have to have a partner. Many people act like that. You know, it's like, well, I have to have a partner. And so I just want to have somebody. But right now, maybe he's just too busy to have a girlfriend. And maybe you're too busy to have a boyfriend. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I could and he could, but yeah, like you said, neither of us, the sacrifices would be texting each other every day and hanging out. And that's what we, that's the effort we would be putting in. Yeah. That's, if that feels like a sacrifice, you guys shouldn't be together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a difference between loving who someone is and being in love. Yeah. And that's where we get confused perhaps because we have a lot of love and respect for each other. Yeah. You care about each other and maybe in the future that will change and grow. You guys can reconnect, but you know, I don't know why you got, you don't, you don't even know why you're together other than a few, how long you been together? A year. Okay. So a year ago you met him, you thought he was hot. He thought you were hot. You had some great chemistry and you got really excited and you thought this guy could be the one. And other than that, you got really nothing keeping you going other than something that happened almost a year ago. You haven't evolved the relationship. You haven't learned, you know, you haven't really grown as a couple. You, you know, you just have been living off this kind of adrenaline and momentum that you got in the first month of dating, which don't feel bad. This, this is a, I I I guarantee you literally tens of thousands of people are tens of thousands of people are listening to this thinking, oh, holy shit. He's talking about me, you know? So you're not alone, you know? And it's a scary world out there because now, you know, we're so, we, we feel okay with prioritizing our own needs, but we want to do it while having someone like be our, to have a partner. I, I think you can be in a relationship and work towards your individual goals, but you have to have a partner who wants to support you and vice versa. And, and you, and there should be a common goal, even if that common goal is to like, make each other feel loved and feel connected and that you're not yeah. with someone who just so is this like matter of fact, be like, well, you know, I just, I just don't love, and it's my feelings have changed and, and they don't want, they shouldn't want to be okay with that. You know, exactly. if, if exactly. it's true, That's then what I feel like if it's true, they should like, say, break up with me. Yeah. If it's true, it should be like, well, babe, I feel less connected to you. What are we going to do to stay connected? Because I want to be in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that long distance would bring us closer together and strengthen the relationship. That was my goal. He is okay with not being connected to you. He is treating you like you are married and that breaking up with you isn't an option and how you feel about each other in this like forced arranged relationship is not his fault and there's nothing he can do about it. And that's just Yeah, because he said reality. it's just how life goes. You know, he was gone and his dog forgot about him too. His dog wasn't as excited when he got home. And he's like, that's normal. Uh, I, sh- sure. Yeah, it's normal to not prioritize being connected with someone and then feel less connected. Correct. And it is normal that if you accept that as okay, it won't change. It's no point in being in a relationship if you two are accepting the bare minimum is okay. Like, don't be in the relationship, especially in your mid-20s. You don't have kids. You're not married. There's literally nothing that's keeping you together other than there being this really good payoff. Like, why are you accepting malaise as, like, acceptable relationship behavior? Yeah. So we're kind of treating it like we're an old married couple. Yeah. I have a poetry night later tonight where I have some poems about him and he's coming, so... 
We'll see how that goes. Okay, but don't be passive aggressive. Don't be condescending. Be direct. No one's a bad guy here. And if you respect and care about them, just have a mature conversation about where you're both at in your lives. And, and don't be petty and don't be passive aggressive. Communicate how you're feeling and just work through it. And if you come to like a common ground where you just say, hey, I care about you. I love you as a person. I respect you. But maybe right now we're holding each other back as individuals. And we're preventing us from maybe being in a happy relationship, whether it's with each other or someone else in the future. So maybe let's just take some time apart. And maybe we should just break up right now and reevaluate our individual needs. Could you have that conversation with him? Because that was perfect. <laughs> sure. Let me know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you guys want to call, come in as a mediation, we'd be happy to have you on. Yeah. I don't think he'd be very happy. I don't think he'd be very happy knowing I'm having this conversation right now. He'll live. Yeah. But I'm happy to, but I think you're, I think you're more than capable of saying this to him. I agree. It's going to take a little um, confidence just because I'm scared to lose him, you know, to circle it back to what you originally said. I need to stop being scared to lose him. Or be vulnerable enough to say that to him and ask if he's willing to be scared enough to lose you too. You're, I like that. You know, both of you seem like you like calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend, but neither of you seem to be willing to do what it takes to make this relationship worth both of your time. So, yes. you know, decide which one it's going to be. It's going to be a hard decision, but I agree. You guys can work through it together. And he seems like a logical, pragmatic guy. I mean, this logic should resonate with him. That's true. And that's why I'm asking your advice, because I'm an emotional person. I'm a hopeless romantic. I like to romanticize everything. And sometimes I think too hard about my words and he's the opposite. I confuse him a lot by overthinking and over talking. Well, you know, that's human. What's the point is the question you should be asking yourself. Why am I doing this? So once you get past the romanticization of it all, like, is it worth your time? What is keeping you together? What is our common goal? Why are we why should we make sacrifices for each other? Are we willing to make sacrifices for each other? These are the questions you ask yourself. Get the answers for yourself and then ask him and see where you guys land. Exactly. Because I don't even know the answers right now. So I have to figure that out before Correct. I ask my boyfriend. Correct. Don't read him these cryptic poems <laughs> that articulate a feeling, but you're not really sure what to do with it. Have, Correct. Have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Good luck. Keep us posted. Thank you so much. All I right. will. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Uh, don't forget to send those questions at asknick at thevilefiles.com. Uh, we'll see you back tomorrow. Bye. Hey, guys, if you loved what you listened to, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.